Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, episode number 114, Trends and the Future. Bum, bum, bum. Ominous. <laughs> so today on the panel is, is myself, Eric Isaacson, and Mark Nadal. Nadal, sorry. Hello. Um, yeah, Mark Nadal. Uh, Mark's been on the show before. You guys probably remember him from uh, the GunDB episode that we, that we did. And um, today we're going to talk about some different stuff related there's we definitely can talk about gundb and the um you know graphql and all these other newer types of data well i guess newer is <laughs> relative but yeah we can talk about a lot of different stuff um as far as like trends in the future for me i'm focused mostly on the front end but i do keep my eye on a lot of technologies um and the back end as well or, or middle tier depending on how you look at it. Um, the communities, I'm always uh, looking at the communities, um, how it affects people who are not necessarily developers, you know, users or, or outside outsiders, people who are like maybe developers who don't keep up with, with things and you are using old technology. How might this, these things affect them? Uh, the future of the industry and programming. So we'll go through a bunch of different things. Yeah, I think so, the best way to hit this subject hard on what are the trends in the industry, the history of the industry, and the future of the industry is to uh, start with interrogating you, Eric, which is nope. you've been around a lot longer than I have, so you have much better experience and observation on kind of what's happened over the last few years. So tell us, I, I think everybody hears you every single episode, but they probably don't know a ton about like your actual background, your upbringing, how you got into programming and how you got into this position that you have been able to influence so many people and, and have a podcast. So come on, give us, give us your story. I'm, we're curious to hear. It's actually not that um, crazy awesome. Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't feel like I, I um, influence a lot of people. Like I, I learn a lot on the show. I come on and I like to hang out with, with people who are like-minded and people who have different opinions than, than I may, I may have, and we get to discuss fun things that we're all passionate about. Um, so I get a lot out of the podcast. Um, okay, so then I mean, I'll, I'll hit you with the hard question. Uh, maybe this is disclosing too much information. What year, what date was the first year that you touched c computers? Computers. Yeah. Hmm. It was the early 80s, definitely. Early 80s? Okay. Mm -hmm. What did computers look like back then? Well, my father had, I remember he had a 13-inch a screen, right? And that was like big. And it was like <laughs> all green, cathode-y with a little blip line. Um, and it was, it was like pretty impressive to see things moving without them being real, per se. So my father, he was a uh, he was a, a hardware guy. He did field technician work. Um, so he was he did some programming on the side. He he worked in BASIC. And um, you know, I got to solder some circuit boards with him and learn about that stuff. But wow. it, the programming always like uh, the programming piece, the software part, was always very daunting. Like I would I would look at it and go, wow. How did you do that? You are too smart for me. I am going to go play Dungeons and Dragons with my friends now. Bye. <laughs> so, I mean, it took me a, lot, a while before I actually touched code. Like, I was building computers and setting up people's scanners and all sorts of hardware for them in the 90s when I was in college for extra money. So, that was a lot of fun because every, every piece of the, the computer then, for PCs at least, had you know, similar similar hardware. So you would you would just have to make sure that, you know, the RAM would work with this particular motherboard and things like that. So it wasn't that hard. It's just not a lot of people really cared to work with it like, like people are today with all the maker movements and things like that. Did you feel like an outsider or outcast because you, your 
your dad did do programming and introduced you to hardware way ahead of the curve compared to other people. Did you feel um, you know, exiled by society much for being a programmer and, and being a quote nerd, <laughs> even though we've come to rule the world, it seems. Actually, there was a lot more judgment on, uh, you know, the, the stuff I did for fun, like the role playing stuff and things like that. Like if, if you knew computers, people were like, whoa, he uses those computer things or she uses those things with the computer thingies. So there was a lot of resistance because, I mean, the Internet when I was in high school was like, you know, nope. there was only a couple of people who had it. You know, so, you know, not to not to date myself, but <laughs> that was like, yeah, it was it was it was out there, but there wasn't a lot of, uh, of that there. So for, for the public, I, I might be wrong on these numbers, but it's so easy for us in the U.S. to think like, oh, everybody's got Internet now. But I think in terms of world population, only two or three billion people have Internet currently. And that's why I'm particularly excited about things like, um, well, even though there's the pros and cons to Facebook providing the quote free Facebook internet. Um, there's whole issues around that. But in the next like three or four years, up to about five billion people are supposed to come online. So if you actually look at the world as a whole, a lot of the people are going through the same sort of thing that you went through a couple well, decades ago. And a lot of the same problems and same struggles that we had that you had, because I wasn't even born at that point. <laughs> um, are, are going to be the same thing that we see people go through now. So I, that that's encouraging to hear that people were excited about like you being the person who knew how to use that magic and have that wizardry power. Uh, Cause hopefully it'll help ease the transition of, of internet um, accessibility. Yeah, it's weird though. I didn't get a lot of attention for that though. It would just be like, Oh, you, you know this, can you, can you help me? But like, it wouldn't be like I, I brought it up uh, when we were at, at a bar or anything, you know. <laughs> it was like, it was like very like, you know, if you know me, you hang out, then you know that I, I've done this stuff. But uh, and so you know, you I would get references from people who would be like, oh yeah, my mother, she needs this thing installed, and yeah, you, know, you could you could like, you know, the scanners back then were you know, and like peripherals were giant. Like a scanner was like twelve hundred dollars, and it was like, you know, the size of maybe like 18 by 24. And then you look at the, the size of the paper inside, like where you would put the paper and it's like, you know, 11 by 17 maybe. And that, that would be like, you know, I'd be like, oh, $50, $50 in 1990, whatever. So, so it's kind of, it's kind of interesting for, for, for a college kid. That's like pretty. Yeah. So, so some of them were $1,200 you're saying, right. And that's crazy. Yeah, some of them, yeah. Now, yeah, some some of the now some 3D printers are available for about like $1,200 or, or like the, um, the DJI Phantom drone, I think is like 1200 bucks and it has a, like a gyroscope stabilized HD camera on it. And you can like fly this drone. That's like crazy. And in just the few decades we've gone from a scanner being $1,200 to like 3D printers and drones being $1,200. That's just think of now in like another couple of decades, how cheap, those technologies will be. Um, so I want to ask you, what, when did you first get into programming professionally? Oh, before I, I get that too, I mean, if you look at, before I answer that, sorry. Yeah, yeah, if you yeah. look at like today, even, um, the uh, there's the NES was re-released, right? So in the original Nintendo with like preloaded games. And that's like 60 bucks, has 30 games in it. When that came out, that was a lot of money. So I think that, I think it's going to go a lot faster for, for people now in, you know, barring any political or, um, or social, you know, um, stoppers, it will be a lot faster to get that technology into people's hands now. Not new technology, stuff like, you know, we take it for granted, like in the U.S., you know, Apple products are available readily, but... You know, sometimes they're sold out, but there's, <laughs> you know, you can't get that everywhere. You can't get the latest and greatest, uh, you know, from them everywhere. So professional programming. So, yeah, sorry, I avoided the question. <laughs> so professional programming, 
Um, I'd say 2007-ish. Like I started playing with code around 2003 because I, I was teaching graphic design and I had to learn some stuff for the web. So I had to learn Dreamweaver and HTML and CSS and a little bit of JavaScript. JavaScript was a little scary at first. It still is scary to most people. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> so what was the trend in 2003? What was that like biggest hype that people were freaking out about and like rewriting the code bases into? And I don't know that there was anything like that that I was aware of because it wasn't until 2006 when I was on an interview to, to get a job um, doing like layouts and, and uh, some print work. And I said that I could do web work. They had asked me, well, do you know Ajax? So there was, um, well, I was on the side of it where I was teaching. So I had, you know, my own little sort of sheltered uh, development area, right? So, so I, I could learn, um, I could learn what I had to, to get by for those sort of things. So like Dreamweaver would have snippets you could use. And then I could go to like W3 schools, which I, I you know, I don't recommend going to now use MDN or <laughs> something, but but like I would, I would look at different examples and you know, the mistakes that I made trying to learn that stuff and teach that stuff to myself, I brought to my students. Cause it was, it was really helpful for teaching because I was only a step or two ahead of them. So that made it very, very accessible. Like I was sort of closer to their level or, you know, versus like if you try to teach everything to everybody at once, that can be really daunting. Yeah. I mean, the best way to, to learn something is to teach it, right? So, like, especially yeah. when it comes to programming, it feels like programming is infinitely teaching because at the end of the day, what we're doing is problem solving. Um, and if, if the problem has already been solved, we don't really have to program it. We just copy and paste that snippet, right? But as long as we're, like, trying to figure out what that what snippet we need to use, we're always trying to, like, problem solve for this thing. And that that's the self-teaching process, which winds up being so important. And I, I think you're right. Trying to teach other people stuff that you don't even know just collectively helps everybody. Especially going back to what you said about like back when you were younger, programming and, and software stuff looked really daunting. It looked like, whoa, I'm not smart enough for that. So it's, you probably don't realize how much of an impact you've had on other people that you did help teach that stuff. You might be thinking, oh, I was just learning that stuff kind of selfishly, but no, like there's, I'm sure tons of people out there that now have these aspiring software careers that are some of the you know highest paid in the nation because you were there to help hold their hands even if you were figuring it out yourself at the same time. I, I just really like community like that because um, it's people coming together and saying we can overcome an obstacle together and that winds up being win-win for everybody. Absolutely. Going from then the professional programming and the trends of that day, Ajax, um, what would you say is kind of the pattern that you've noticed over, you know, since let's say 2005-ish, the last, the last decade? Um, how many times do you think the pendulum has swung back and forth between you know client side technologies, web side, uh, server side technology, like what's your observations? Well, I think it was um, it was definitely it was definitely harder to to use client side because nobody really wanted to to work with HTML or CSS. It was considered like a joke, like especially especially JavaScript, right? It was really hard to say, but I think it was mostly server side and like people would hire hire me just because, you know, like, well, I don't want to deal with this stuff. I'm a Java developer or I'm a .NET developer. This person knows this stuff. And it was mostly, it was mostly like um, toy markup, especially CSS, um, CSS now, even I think to a degree, a lot of people, they don't want to deal with it. It's like, okay, now JavaScript has gained lots of popularity. It's been, you know, a long time uh, since it, it was considered actually, you know, like it was considered 
crap, but we needed to have it because it's the only way we can get some crazy functionality without using applets or servlets in our browsers. One of the things that I noticed is that it started to get this trend of the user experience. The UI became much, much more prevalent over the past decade where people were starting to actually use the internet more. People were starting to, you know, now that as soon as 2006 came, you know, the iPhone one was released. They said HTML5 is going to be the future. They lied to us. <laughs> but Apple did what they had to do, and, and that helped us move, actually, um, and gain a lot of traction. Um, well, great points. So kind of getting into the community side, how um, did you specifically have to reach out to, like, JavaScript communities to, to start figuring out how to tackle those things? Or would you say there was kind of a natural evolution from the existing, you know, programming colleagues that you had, whether – it was JavaScript or not, and, and you just kind of accidentally found yourself in a community that was talking more and more about web technologies? Or would you say there was a conscientious effort to form a community around web technologies? I definitely think there was a conscientious effort, not on my part, but I mean, people like Brian Cardell and um, you know Tim, uh, Tim uh, Berners-Lee and, you know, um, to people from from Google like Alex Russell and um, you know, people who have have been there from the beginning with the communities they they really pushed that even jQuery jQuery had a huge community um, they still do but I mean it was it was really huge when I was using jQuery heavily and I didn't really pay too much attention at first because like I said I started in design I wanted to stay away from the code but I found that wow the code is interesting to me now. After that interview where they talked about Ajax, I looked that up and I'm like, oh my gosh, that is pretty amazing. Maybe I should look into this stuff. It took me a while to get JavaScript because if you aren't trained as a programmer and you're trying to teach yourself to program, learning things like arrays, which seems so simple now, not so simple when, you know, if you're coming from a design background. So so looking looking at stuff like that, it's... it's um. It's, it's, you know, like as far as me getting into a community, I think that happened by, by accident because a lot of the jobs that I was at, we used a lot of open source stuff. And there was people who had com contributed back. And then I was at a job in the financial industry where um, I couldn't give back. Like they wouldn't allow you to unless you went through their lawyers. And their lawyers took forever. And, you know, after a year I gave up trying to get permission to do anything. And so I really said, you know, next job, I'm going to make sure I spend time investing in, in community. And I was listening to a lot of podcasts and I was like, wow, maybe I should do something like this. And one of my colleagues at uh, three pillar, when I was there, three pillar global, great company, especially for user experience. Um, Will, Will Sherlin, who's uh, still a digital marketing person there. He, um, he started a podcast there and he showed me, you know, how to set up a podcast and do all that. And I owe a lot to him for, for this. It's because uh, it, I was like, Oh, I'd love to do a developer podcast. And I was originally going to do one for, for three pillar, but they decided they wanted to talk about different things. And so it actually worked out for everybody. Let's talk about that more community building, right? Like that is so important nowadays. And not that it wasn't important before, but, um, it, the industry is really remarkable compared to even other strongly community based industries like academia. My wife's an academic, she's got a fully funded PhD program in psychology and the tech industry holds more conferences than the academic community does. And remember the academic community is the people who were like meeting during world war one and world war two to watch like uh, solar or lunar eclipses to check if Einstein's theories were correct. So like, and that was back before the internet, right? Like they're like hand mailing yeah. each other. So academics is a really strong sense of community. But nowadays, like, I, for instance, I just got back from Italy uh, where I had the honor of talking about my open source project, Gun, and people are so encouraging. They, they offer to you know put you up in a hotel they like pay for your dinners they let you speak they invite you and and that's just so radically different from so many other parts 
uh, other industries. So community building is something you kind of have to consciously attack and your friend teaching you how to get set up and doing podcasting. I'm sure that was before Google Hangouts, right? So it was a little bit more difficult, but talk more about how do we make effort, effortful dedication to building communities, making sure that we increase diversity and be accepting and encouraging to people. And otherwise, unfortunately, I think our industry is also pretty arrogant and pretty, um, and pretty, uh, patronizing to a lot of people. So, so how do you overcome those things and build lasting communities that feel uplifted, encouraged, and propel things forward? Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> I mean, there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of technology that's also assisted this along the way for building communities. So originally, if if like. When I was when I was in high school, I was obsessed with um, horror movies and Fangora uh, magazine and Starlog magazine. So you don't buy too many magazines today that are in print. But if I wanted to learn how to do like makeup, like these people who did Predator and who did RoboCop and all these other movies that I loved, I was like, I have to learn it somehow. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have these other things, and so. I had to go to that that community where it resided was in on print. And so you had to go in, you'd find out, oh, I can order this from this company and they would advertise in there. So you can order those things and then there'd be like, you know, go to my website and I have a tutorial, you know, this was later on, but, you know, or you can order a book from me on how to do this, um, those type of things. So it was really like a slow learning process and now we have stuff like um, Slack and these chat um, applications and you know Google Hangouts. We have uh, Vine and all sorts of you know interesting social technologies that enable us to do a lot more than that quicker. So I, if you want to set up a podcast and go out there, if you want to blog, whatever your medium is, because a lot of people say, oh, I don't want the overhead of a podcast. I don't want to do this or that. Whatever you're comfortable with, just get out there and say what you have to say. You know, we're lucky. I mean, you said that there's a lot of arrogance in our industry, and there is, but there's also a lot of love. There's also a lot of like, you know, and I hate to sound all tree tree huggy, but there's a lot of people out there in our industry which are very diverse. We have people from all over the world, um, all different genders, all different shades of skins. You know, it's it's amazing that we can unite under the umbrella of technology. And that's one of the things I love about this industry. You know, and we, we have a lot of problems that we're still overcoming with, you know, sexism and racism. You see it sometimes like with the Gamergate thing and, you know, going to different conferences. And um, it's, it can be hard, but it's great that everyone has a voice that they can actually speak out against that and come together. And it's like you said, when you went to Italy, these people are paying for you to do things. And it's it's a lot like that if you're involved in the community heavily. It sucks that not everyone can do that, you know, for not because we won't allow them to, but, you know, maybe because of where they live or what the rules are in, in their countries for doing this stuff, it's um, we have we have a we have a, a wonderful community, but also a very difficult road ahead. Those are really really powerful words, and I just want to repeat some of the the highlights there, which is like you mentioned to people that like the technology to just get out and blog and podcast is so much easier now, and that encouragement to people is really important and thank you so much for you know fighting back against my, my comments and saying that yeah there are problems in this industry but ultimately we're we're going to come out on top because we win we focus and we love and we invite and we encourage people that is so important to to say to focus on the good positive things versus just the negative things and and the last part there where okay um if sure the 
the conferences often it's not the the audience that's um, going and getting paid and doing the, the speaking. So it can seem kind of exiling or one-sided. And this is where I want to definitely encourage people, like you were saying, uh, it's, I was a basement dwelling nerd just like a, like two years ago. Nobody knew about me. I, and lots of people still don't know about me, but when I started engaging in the community, um, let me take a quick side tangent here. I, I've been using node since like 0.2. I've found out that some of like, nice. the I found out that like some of the board of directors like or in the committee or whatever it's called have have been using node um, for a less amount of time than I have and the it just kind of makes me kick myself because I thought back then like oh I'm a nobody so I don't I don't have a place in like spending all this time emailing people and like discussing with people because I you know that's just not my place but I'm I'm like kind of now kicking myself because if I had just let myself be an introvert sitting in my basement, but send a couple messages over the forums or, you know, the chat groups and be like, Hey people, you know, I'm using node. This is really cool. And I'm excited about it. That, that would have made such a drastic difference in my own personal life because I would have accelerated most of the people I know now from potentially five years earlier. And, and my kind of pro tip, and I actually learned this from the famous uh, programmer Substack. Um, I was like, Substack, how on earth do you get paid to be flown all around the world and go to these conferences and talk about your technology? And he's like, oh, there's this, uh, so this is a, a insider secret. Uh, there's this really awesome website called Lanyard that posts all of the conferences that are coming up and has the call for proposals. So I want to encourage people, like, get out, blog, Get out, do your own podcasts, get out and submit call for proposals to your, to the upcoming conferences, to the big conferences, to the small conferences, to your local meetups, and be engaged, be excited. Don't, um, it, it's easy for us to be timid, but um, there, there's too much opportunity to lose. But on the flip side, there's a big warning. If you do do this, you have to be willing to confront rejection a lot of potential hate by people and a lot of uh, negativity because for all the conferences you submit, you're going to get rejected by like potentially 99% of them. And this is where I kind of want to evolve the discussion a little bit more into um, game theory and numbers, which is, um, so I'm going to switch over to kind of my background with, with gun, which is a completely open source project. It's MIT licensed. So it's very, very liberal. Um, compared to most databases out there, which are like GPL or AGPL and stuff like that, I I was still able to raise a seed round from a couple of billionaire investors, Tim Draper and Mark Benioff of Salesforce. And I, I can throw this out and it sounds like bragging and it sounds like arrogance, but I want to use it as a vehicle for encouragement because again, like just a few years ago, I was a basement dwelling um, open source coder that like could hardly communicate my ideas to people. But I took this leap of faith of being willing to put myself out there, get rejected by a lot of people. And yeah, there was that negativity to the community. But when I did put myself out there more, I also got sweeped into a lot of communities that were so accepting, so encouraging, and, and so uplifting. And that has literally, for my life, made a world of difference being going from um, where I was at before to to now running an open source company that's funded. The funding cycle is the same sort of um, numbers game. I had to meet with countless numbers of investors who all told me no, who all told me, oh, not a fit, or I'm not in that industry, or you, know, you don't have traction, or you don't have number, or blah, 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 blah. You get so many no's, it can be so disheartening, it can be so just crushing. But the more no's you get, it's a probability game, it's a st statistics, is likely that you'll then get to a yes. Or one of those people who are accepting and loving and encouraging and can mentor you, so. I bet you, you really took that to heart too when those people said that, because I know your personality some, somewhat from having spoken with you before, you're very positive and outgoing and open, and I love that. 
And uh, some people take it and they take it to a dark place, but if you're positive about these things, you can learn. And so the next time you go to an investor, you did a little better. The next time you went to an investor, I'm sure you did a little better because you know what to look for. You know what they're going to be saying. It's, it's going to be um, a lot easier as you go through and it gives you confidence. You know, whereas in the beginning you're like, holy, I don't know anything. I'm like, I don't know what to do. Um, at least, at least I would, I felt that way, like with things like interviews and, you know, um, I had an interview once where it was a, it was a big company. I was like, oh, I'm really excited. And, and then they asked me a question like, so have you used any CSS frameworks? And I'm like thinking in my head, oh my God, there's frameworks for CSS. Right. <laughs> and so, so like now we, we think about that, like, oh, wow, what are you, you know, you crazy, but it, there wasn't a lot of them then. And so I was, I was confused and I'm like, well, you know, I really, I really don't use any, but can you tell me about them? Because I, I've never heard of this. And, you know, they, they told me about it and I learned a lot just from that interview. Like I got something out of it, even though I didn't get the job, obviously. <laughs> On, on that note, really quickly, I want to echo back to what you were saying about how, like, you didn't know some of the stuff, but you still went ahead and tried to teach people it. Um, and, and, I, yeah. and that goes hand in hand with the encouragement that we're trying to tell people to get out and podcast and to blog and to talk at uh, meetups. You, you probably think, oh, I don't know this thing. But if you just kind of take a stab and try and teach other people, uh, you'll have this really wonderful experience where <laughs> if you're wrong, people will correct you. <laughs> um, and, and for where the stuff that you do know, you're sharing a lot of powerful skills and a lot of powerful information to other people. And, and slowly over time, as you just do that more and more, um, you, you kind of get you get more and more reach in as you meet more people and get more connected and, uh, and are able to go to conferences out in like Europe and stuff like that. Or if you're from Europe going to conferences in, in America or India. Um, Oh yes, yes, yes. So, so thank you for the compliment about my positivity and, um, outgoingness. I, I want to emphasize to other people that those are not like automatic born traits that you're just like born with there there's stuff you have to work hard at so like if, if you're one of those like depressed people that are out there and then you know you hear all these people talking about positivity you don't have to feel like you are predetermined by your existing conditions you can yes it's hard but um you know don't don't feel overwhelmed or crushed by that like fight for for that that love and that encouragement and teaching others. So, and I think you were alluding to some of this earlier too, with with the ar the arrogance comment that you had said, where you know there is in the open source this open source community, I should say, there is some people who go on Reddit or Hacker News and and like you know it's great that you get up there. It's pretty impressive. <clears throat> Gundy Beach was just up there, and still is, <laughs> but. It's um. It's also can be really painful because people have no filter when they go on there and they'll tell you exactly what they think, like you said, and that can really, really hurtful. And I think it's important that to take those sort of things, and it's not easy, like you said, it's not born, but to take those sort of things and be like, okay, let me, let me, let, let me sit with that for a minute and, you know, respond to this person in a positive way, not be like, you know, more negativity upon more negativity, it's just going to turn to a, to a, um, I don't know, how do I say this nicely? A, uh, a mean, a mean back and forth fight verbally <laughs> or, or on, on Reddit or wherever it is. Uh, you can even see it on GitHub in, in, on some of these issues that are really, um, you know, people really care about. Sometimes you'll have an issue on some, some repo and somebody will say, you know, you're, you're an, you're an, an, an idiot for putting this on here. What were you thinking? You know, like, and that's just not, that's not how our, our, our industry should really be. Um, and, and I think that's the minority. It's not the majority. I've encountered so much more positivity than negativity, but I have, I have seen that before and I try and stay away unless it's, 
you know, something I feel like I can contribute to positively. You know, you can go to meetups. When I first went to meetups here in Reston, Virginia, I went to a JavaScript meetup and, you know, I was talking about things. I was very interested. I wanted to learn so much and I wanted to be at, at least one of these a week and see this, uh, see people talk about what they're doing and what they're, they're um, contributing back to the community. And, you know, they, they, they said to me, uh, well, why don't you speak at one of our events? And I was like, oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know what I would say. And that sort of surprised people where, you know, they were like, what do you mean? You don't know what you would say. Like I didn't have an, an, an opinion. So that was bad. Really kind of, kind of looked at that and said, you know, maybe, maybe I, I should think about what are the things that are important to me and what are the things that I want to talk about? Sorry, my, my internet cut out, so I missed probably some really good points of what you were saying. Um, no, I, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> I'm going to say that. We're, we're trying to be encouraging here, and that in, includes uh, to, to both of us. No, but. I'm joking. I'm okay. joking. Um, so I'm going to actually uh, quickly diverge the subject into exactly what I'm going through, right? Like, uh, I supposedly have like five megabit per second internet, which is like revolutionary comp compared to the DSL and capped satellite internet I grew up with. But it, it's remarkable that, that like, we got to think, like, most people don't have internet that is as good as what we have. So it, it's, it's, again, one of those things where, like, not only can you might feel like an outsider as you're trying to get into the community and um, or have a bunch of hate from people on Hacker News or whatnot, but you can also just be an outsider where, where you can look around yourself, like what Eric was saying, how... Apple products are so abundant in the US. You might look around yourself and and not come from having that type of of accessibility to whether it be good hardware or computers or or internet access. Um, that's again why I'm kind of excited about this idea of five billion people coming online in the next three years. Hopefully that connection will help build uh, more communities. Uh, I think the majority of those, though, are going to be, um, you know, not to jump into the technology side, 45 minutes in, but, <laughs> you know, the I think it's going to be Internet of Things. It's going to be a lot of, you know, a lot of Internet of Things and some mobile that's going to be growing. I think the number of desktops will be not, not as growing as quickly. So I want to uh, pivot in since, yeah, we are get running out of time to to the future, the future of the industry, the future of programming. Because um, we've seen the trends, like you're saying, that there's um, Slack and stuff now. You know, back in the late 90s, there's IRC. And then in the 2000s, there's MSN, Messenger, and, and AIM, and uh, Google Talk that really kind of shattered everything. And they, were, they all had an open protocol, an open standard to communicate with each other. And then a few years later, the, the walled gardens of like Facebook Messenger and Slack come around, and there's you know, these trends that just go back and forth. So I'm going to start with um, messaging and the community side. I, I predict that like in the next few years, we're gonna swing back and you're gonna start seeing a ton of chat apps that all interoperate with each other and are not walled gardens. And it's gonna be the same thing back in the day, like uh, what was the protocol for messaging? Um, the, uh, XMPP, right? Or? I, for, I forget actually, I don't know. So the, what's, what's the stab on, make a prediction. So for the chat stuff, I think I think you're right, but I think it's going to be more of interaction across other applications as well, like like uh, Alexa and Siri type of things, but more of an open. Um, I mean, I have nothing, no facts to base this on, just kind of observations of what I'm seeing. And so, what about um, front end web technologies? We you talked about jQuery and how huge the community was, and now we got Angular and uh, React and that transition, what do you think is kind of going to be the next big thing based off of you know, these, these swings that you've seen? Well, I think that's a tough one because that covers a lot of ground. But as far as like the user interfaces, um, the stuff that we see in React that's going to be, um, you know, that makes React great, um, to some people, 
it's it, you know the virtual DOM in particular. Um, we might see some of that roll into the actual DOM itself, right, where it handles that underneath. Because I mean, from Microsoft, who had said this, it was um, it was Daniel Buckner who was on the podcast, and he said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had that in the browser engines, you know, and then we wouldn't need React, we wouldn't need these things, and that happened with jQuery, right? We had jQuery handle all these things that we hated about the DOM. And now a lot of it is part of the DOM. And uh, Brian Cardell said this too. You know, look at document.query selector. That's basically jQuery, right? Uh, query selector all, same thing. Um, so, so I think what we see incorporated into the actual platform, that'll be kind of proof of what's going to be, what was really valuable and what's not. You know, web components are starting to come about, but there's so many um, hurdles we still have for web components. Time will tell. We've, we've tried to do this a few times, um, but I think this is I think this is the time it's going to work. It's just going to take a while to get there. Do you think that uh, there's going to be a major shift in how we program in the same way that you know JavaScript was kind of laughed at before? <laughs> now it's this <laughs> world. I think, like you said, it's cycles. I think right now we're we're really focused on this whole. You know, get your environment set up, have like an entire front end client side application. We have like so many moving parts in our build systems, transpilers, precompilers, you know, web webpack we we're using here quite a lot, and that's um that's been that's been great. It's a tremendous tool. It's just there's a lot of complexity. When I first learned HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, it was a flat file. And then you would just add that to your to your code base in SVN or whatever. To be honest, that's still how I roll because it's so much simpler. But with the advent of things like Babel and the transpiler, I'm going to make this prediction. Um, and it's something I'm actively working towards, and one of the reasons why I'm building Gun and need a graph database. Um, my prediction is that, and I have to explain this because it's pretty far reaching. Is that in the same way like that Babel will convert your ES6 code into ES5? Think about that in just the programming wars. So many people complain about like spaces versus tabs, semicolons versus no semicolons. But now that we're at the point where like, like everybody's writing in, it seems like 20 different compiled to JavaScript languages, TypeScript, CoffeeScript, um, uh, uh, you know. Uh, Whatever the new hotness is these days, yeah. right? You, you kind of got to realize that perhaps syntax and language from a text-based format matters less and less. So here's kind of my, my big reveal. At the end of the day, the way that Babel and, well, for, for this subject, not big reveal of everything, but <laughs> um, the same way that Babel and transpilers convert the code, they look at what is known as the abstract syntax tree. Of the code. That is the pure logic representation of the code. And if you start thinking about it, it's kind of bizarre that we do code version control, Git and stuff, off of the text of the code. Imagine if we did version control based off of the AST, the abstract syntax tree of the code. What this would allow for people is that everybody could have their own holy war standard of you know spaces versus tabs, semicolons versus non-semicolons, because the actual source code that is synced over GitHub and Git and stuff is just the diffs on the AST directly, the graph of the data. Um, and then when you wind up editing the code, it's just automatically transpiled and babelified into your particular um, you know, spaces or tabs or semicolons. So everybody winds up being happy. This is a win-win for people. At, I mean, people still want to debate the war of spaces versus tabs, Pepsi versus Coke. But at the end of the day, this is like really satisfying because uh, people blindly get the the design they prefer, and but we're still able to collaborate and uh, interact with each other. And then I'm, I take this prediction one step further that now once the code is being um, version controlled off of the AST of the code, slowly programming itself is going to move more and more to like this weird Lisp style coding where you're like you're you're potentially directly manip manipulating 
the code, not necessarily typing. You might be typing, but um, this calls to mind like Brett Victor and, and Alan Kay that they have this beautiful future of what programming could look like where uh, you're not just sitting back and always typing. You're actually like interacting directly with it. Um, so I'll, I'll stop with my ramble right there, <laughs> even though I have tons I'd love to talk about. Now, Brett Victor, he has some great videos. Um, I, I wonder, though, like, will that happen sooner or later? I, I think it's something like that in your prediction. Um, I think it's one of those things where you have to have a slow transition because it is mm -hmm. so upsetting to the status quo. And there's talking about like anthropology and social psychology, which is like random leap here. Um, there's this wonderful book called Non-Zero Sum by Robert Wright, where he like looks at the entire history of how civilizations have developed. And he makes this weird observation, hopefully I'm quoting him correctly, that the faster a society progresses, the faster it's able to um, like lubricate um, technology exchange between people, it winds up accidentally resulting in, um, in what he call in, in like dictatorships and um, big men and, and people who wind up taking all that technology and hoard it for themselves. But if you instead have kind of a slower development of progress and technology, which sounds depressing initially, that that winds up trickling out to competing countries, to competing civilizations. And because it then uh, distributes more uniformly, there is more of an equal balance of, of those competing ideas. And so less, uh, less revolutions wind up happening as a result because you can think of it at the end of the day, everybody has a gun or everybody has a dagger. Everybody's equally as dangerous. But if technology advances way too quickly, you get like the United States that winds up developing the nuclear bomb before anybody else, right? And, and that comes with a lot of power distinct from other um, countries. So <laughs> that was a random, probably seemingly schizophrenic jump, but I want to bring it back to the coding because we're attached to these traditions and our, our, oh, what's the grimace? Do you want to, you want to jump in here? No, I'm just, I'm just like, you know, like technology, it has this, this dual duality to it. And like, I'm listening to you talk about the, the horror side of it, the, the, um, the blade versus the flower or the or the the helpful item. <laughs> so so it's interesting. I, I'm not trying to be pessimistic here. I, I uh, sorry, I'm probably sounding too negative in this podcast, even though we're trying to focus on positive. Well it's it's very what you're saying is very, very true. Um, uh, there is there is the other side to that, uh, the naive side as some people might put it. Uh, where it, technology the more the faster we advance, the the more good we can do. Yes. And also the more danger. And I actually wanna uh, Yeah uh, uh, tie this into what we we're talking about before. I think part of the reason why our industry is able to be so loving and encouraging and move forward is because we're actually willing to talk about our problems, to talk about our difficulties, to talk about our sexism, our racism, and the problems that we have and confront it rather than hide it and ignore it. And when we're able to have that discussion, it opens the platform and the field open to, to emerging more discussion and, and more outsider perspective. So, um, with, you know, the advances of technology, yeah, a lot of danger comes, but a lot of opportunity comes as long as we're willing to also admit the dangers of how we can use the technology. Because the more we talk about those dangers, the more we can bring awareness to others in order to stop um, attacks in the first place. That's why in, in cybersecurity and, you know, you always hear about zero-day exploits on the top of Hacker News, that Chrome has this zero-day exploit. It's so important to have, I forget the term, like a full disclosure or whatever, when you're when you're trying to hack into a company, that if the, if you privately disclose to the company first for them to fix it, if they don't fix it, you you go public with the information because the worst thing for that company is is because you might be a, a moral hacker, right? You might be a moral cracker where you're, you're a white hat uh, cracker. Um, so you don't personally want to exploit the system, but if you publish the source code on how to have the heart bleed exploit, then like suddenly right? Bam. The more awareness there is for the, on the dangers of technologies, the faster that people are going to move to, to fix and solve those problems. Um, so yeah, typically white hat security hackers will, will disclose that information to the, to the professionals that need to have it first. And then they'll put it out there and say, Hey, this is the vulnerability. By the way, it was fixed by these people. 
<laughs> you right. know? Yeah. Hopefully. It, it, Sometimes it happens the other way, like you're saying. And that that's that's very dangerous. But I mean, if there's always gonna be people like that, it's the whole argument, um, the philosophical argument of um of you know, guns out there and providing weapons uh to to people, allowing them to get weapons quicker. And we don't have to go into that, but I'm just saying it's the same idea where where you know you can do a lot of good or you can do a lot of bad, and there's always going to be bad people trying to do bad things. So I think the more understanding we have, the more prepared we'll be for these things, and we should never forget what's happened throughout history because, as we see, like like patterns like expressed in flux and things like that, like like these things come back around. Like flux isn't a totally original idea; that was ideas that were brought about in earlier programming. It's just now it was made to work within a different context. There's things things like that where we can do so much good. I know I've strayed, I've gone across a few th few different things, but we can do a lot of good or we can do a lot of bad. But I think spreading knowledge is is neutral. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for reemphasizing the importance of uh, disclosing privately the. The security vulnerability to get it fixed first before the, the public disclosure and and if the company refuses to fix that problem right then that yes yeah. absolutely um, so I, I do think that moving into the prediction of the future of programming as i've sort of is going to be a very slow tedious struggle because um it's the same thing with science and the standard model the standard model is there for a very good reason. And same thing with text-based programming as well. The reason why text-based programming is here is because it is, it's really important and has led to a lot of success. So people are not gonna give up on that because it's tried and true, it's solid, it's known. And, and I'm not discrediting that in any way, shape or form, it needs to keep on going, but I do think we're going to see a slow transition through time into kind of what I'm what I'm predicting, um, more Lisp style direct manipulation of the AST. And sorry if I've lost some of the audience on um, the vocabulary I was pulling out. It's I, I'd encourage people to um, check out you know the history of programming and the history of these trends that we've been talking about. It's really fascinating. Anyways, we're, yeah, a lot of we're probably when you bring up AST. People are like, "What are you talking about?" You know. Um, so it's it's kind of can I guess I guess maybe we can have a link in the show notes on kind of what what you're talking about so that people can research to start their research at least on something like that. There's actually there's actually this really cool uh, I think it's called Esprimo. It's a JavaScript AST converter for JavaScript and um I think I have I think it's called Esprimo. If you hit the website they have this really cool um uh, section of the website where you can paste in some code that you've written and hit render and it'll render your code into a um, in, into a data visualization into a graph so you can see what the v8 JavaScript engine underneath like looks at the code so I think that would probably be the best way to get like a very blatant visual like oh this is what people are uh, this is what we're talking about um, it's a great project by the way very cool. As far as you know, the, the the whole front end technology in general, like aside from the AST stuff that you're talking about, the front end technology, I, I didn't emphasize earlier, but I think because of the complexity and the different the the divergence of you know we have two billion JavaScript libraries or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> not that many, but there's there's quite a lot. There's so much um, out there and so many different complex you know, build steps we have to do for a lot of this stuff that I think, I think at some point there's going to be a movement to go back to our roots of simplicity. Yes. So two notes on that. And I, I guess we're probably starting to get um, out of time, but uh, I'm just so excited because we, we should have got into the future sooner. Um, to me, I've already kind of started that movement personally for myself. I, I do use simpler tools and I try and avoid, and that, that does lead to a lot of, hate discussion and I want to encourage people who use Webpack and love Webpack to keep on doing that because 
uh, to me, I see tools as a utility. So if it's beneficial to your development, use it. But I also ask, please don't judge me, where if I just want to have a, an HTML JavaScript file <laughs> and refresh my browser, it, it's so much more productive for me. And that's what we're trying to get at, win-win for everybody. But the second thing, and just as a compliment to the people who have built all these beautiful um, yet complicated build steps, is if we slowly start throwing in things like machine learning, into the development cycle itself, it's possible that we can get all of the benefits, all of the gains, all the advantages of those systems, but also have kind of robots automatically doing the hard work for us. No, so that's a great point, actually. It's, um, you know, any, there's, there's always trade-offs. The more abstraction you have, the easier it is to do, the less control you'll have. So, um, I don't think that will change. There will always be trade-offs in software development. And, you know, as far as, you know, whether we're using Agile or we're doing different methodologies, that'll probably change and go back and forth. But I think overall, there's always going to be problems and challenges to solve, you know, um, challenges to hurdle over. So we're going to, that'll never change. So like when you're interviewing someone or you're interviewed, you know, if you can solve problems with the tools that are given to you, you're going to be valuable no matter what. Absolutely. And I think that is a great tie in to the majority of what we we're talking about before and why it's so important for people to get out, to teach others, to have community, because um, at the end of the day, it's not just copying and pasting. You, you can definitely start with that, but it is definitively problem solving. There's always going to be a new problem to solve. And the best way to solve those problems is together graciously with people by teaching people so that way you learn yourself and that's the importance of community positivity and putting yourself out there even if it is scary yeah and it's still scary for for most of us <laughs> so <laughs> yeah well um should we wrap it up i mean i i still have tons yeah. of more comments about the future but i think we're going over an hour now so we usually, you know, have a guest talk about, you know, like, oh, what's your Twitter handle and how can people contribute? So, I mean, Gun GunDB on GitHub, get out there, do some PRs and, you know, at the very least, some issues. Um, yeah. People can find you on Twitter. I, I want to shout out to actually the Node.js team because they have pushed really hard for this idea called open, open source, which is if people contribute and if they're involved, um, like they should have the right to have commit access. They should have the right to actually have a say in the project. Um, and that's, that's such a big difference from even some other open source projects that have political boards that stand behind them and don't let commits happen unless they're an employee of the company or something like that. So what Eric is saying is, is really important, not just to a, a project like Gun, but... Yeah, on that note too, um, there's, you know, there's a lot of repositories that, that don't do that. And there's even those that, you know, a lot of popular ones that we, we may or may not know, um, that will have their repository on, in their company. And then what they'll do is once it's at stable versions, that's where they, they put it out to GitHub. So it's sort of like, a they're maintaining two different copies of that repository, one that's open source and one that's theirs. All right, my internet's been bad. I, I just got back, so I missed what you said. But, um, yeah. Um, I was just talking to myself. It's all good. <laughs> great. Well, it's been great having this conversation with you, Eric. Thanks for sharing your story, giving us your insights into patterns and trends and you know where we're at and where we're going. It's It's been fun. Yeah, I love it. Thanks for coming on and uh, grilling me. Um, <laughs> We don't get to, to chat so much, and you just got back like today or yesterday, right? From Italy? On Wednesday, so. On Wednesday? So you've missed a lot here in the United States. <laughs> we won't talk about that, though, on this show. That's <laughs> true. Well, but, um, but, yeah, it's, you know, it's been great. Um, you know, we've been the – rest, the rest of us on the, on the, uh, the web platform have been really busy – well, so, some of us have at least, like Leon, uh, Justin, and I have been doing Web Components Remote Conf, uh, which we're doing in February. 
And so we didn't get to talk about remote conferences, but that's something that uh, I really like because anybody from anywhere can do one of these if you if you sort of try and play around with the time zones and see what you can do. What's are you gonna post the link for that? Yeah, I'll put that on the show notes. All right, so I think that's a wrap. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Eric. And we'll catch you all. And great. Hells yeah. <laughs> See you all next week. Bye. You want to learn more about what's coming on next on the Web Platform Podcast? Follow us on Twitter at, at the Web Platform or on Google Plus and YouTube at Plus the Web Platform. We also need your help in creating transcripts of the episodes and helping to create open source projects under our GitHub organization. Contact Eric Isaacson at E Isaacson or Danny Blue at D underscore Blue. That's D E E underscore B L O O. Thank you for listening, everybody, and we'll catch you all next week. <laughs>